Well, let's go ahead and get started. My name is Leslie Wagoner. I'm an archivist at the American Heritage Center, but I'm also the court, one of the coordinators for the Malcolm Wallop Fund for Conversations on Democracy. That's who's sponsoring this afternoon's event. And we're sponsoring another event you may know about this evening at 7 p.m. at the College of Arts and Sciences Auditorium on social media and the national election. I've got some programs for that evening event up here if you want to take a look. Feel free to take one if you like. Before I introduce Kristen, I just want to really quickly tell you about the Malcolm Wallop Fund, what, that, what that's about. It's a nonpartisan UW initiative created by the former staffers of Malcolm Wallop, who was a senator, U.S. senator, for Wyoming from 1977 through 95. And his staffers were, I would say they loved their boss. I see them, some of them before us now. They, they truly thought so much of him, loved him so much, that they wanted to establish, establish a program in his name. And two years ago, they did that. And I am proud to be the coordinator of, of that fund. And what the fund does is it promotes um, the discussion of democracy through symposia, through events like this one, through the event we'll have this evening, through keynote speakers, student projects, student research awards, which we're working on now. We want to add to the body of knowledge about democracy. So don't miss our 7 p.m. event at the College of Arts and Sciences Auditorium. It's going to be fantastic. I'm excited about it. And so Kristen Landreville is um, UW Communication and Journalism Department. And the Wallop Fund is helping Kristen out with, with her project, which she is doing with her students, and she'll talk more about that. And her, we felt that her topic was very much fitting to the Wallop Fund's mission and purposes. And so we're very happy to, to sponsor um, Kristen's project, and I'll let Kristen go from here. Well, thank you so much, Leslie, for your introduction, and thank you to the Malcolm Wallop Fund for your um, generous grant. We did a lot with it, I think, and we're going to present some of the research today. Um, we are going to start with our presentation on the focus groups. So we did a series of focus groups this summer that looked at um, the average Wyomingites use of social media and new media for politics. We're gonna present on that first. Um, Caitlin White is gonna present that. Caitlin White, she is uh, getting her um, uh, master's degree right now. And uh, next we're going to have um, Sam Allen present and Callie, or Kaylee McCracken, excuse me. And um, they are um, going to present research on the debate projects that we did. We did a series of debate projects um, where we asked students about um, their opinions about the candidates. We asked about their knowledge. Um, and then they watched the debates. And then they took another survey about uh, the same type of questions. And we're seeing how the debate influenced them. And uh, Sam, he is a first-year master's student in our program, and he's also a graduate assistant for the debate team. And um, Kaylee here, she is a senior. She's graduating in May, and uh, she is getting her bachelor's in international studies and journalism. Is that correct? Okay. So they're going to present on the debate studies, and we're really excited that you guys are all here. Thank you so much for coming out. And uh, Caitlin's going to start, so here is Caitlin. All right, so I'll be presenting our study on small town, big election, a look at new alternative and emerging uh, media sources used by rural residents during the 2012 presidential campaign. Um, the focus group, as Kristen said, took place over the summer of 2012 in various Wyoming communities. Um, the research team for this study was Dr. Landerville, myself, and two student research assistants, Seneca Riggins and Lillian Palmer. And I acted as the moderator during our focus groups. 
For our purpose and summary, our focus group research sought to understand to what extent Wyoming residents feel engaged and connected with political media. We explored how and why Wyoming residents use or do not use traditional and new media, and we examined whether Wyoming residents feel that media is helpful in relation to politics. We were interested in this topic because it gave insight as to where Wyoming residents learn about politics through media use. It was designed to show how residents use and negotiate political information within a rural strait during a presidential campaign. We felt that this was important research to explore because Wyoming is not seen at the forefront during a presidential campaign and is a rural state with a small population at about 568,000 in 2011. With a certainty of a Republican vote, with 144,275 Republican registered voters and 46,855 Democrat registered voters, it is unknown how involved residents are with political campaigns and political media. For our methodology and data collection, we did six focus groups in, Wyoming, in five Wyoming communities and one student focus group for a total of 40 participants. All of these participants were required to be of voting age and a Wyoming resident, whether it was a community focus group or a student focus group. The questions used in this discussion were related to new media, political news and information, and political connection and engagement. The participants were required to fill out a pre-discussion survey and post-discussion survey in addition to the focus group discussion, and the focus groups lasted about an hour and a half. For our participant demographics, we had, again, 40 participants. In Cheyenne, we conducted two focus groups with a total of 12 participants, eight of them men and four of them women. In the first group, we had all between the ages of 45 and 70 for our participants, and the second group had a wider age range, with some of them being younger voters. Five were recruited on arrival, and seven of them were recruited prior to the study. In Gillette, we had two focus groups with 13 participants, six of them men, seven of them women. We had no age identifiers in either group, but there was a good variety of occupations and political viewpoints, and all participants were recruited prior to the study. In Sheridan, we conducted one focus group with eight participants, four men and four women. In that age group, most of them were middle-aged, but we did have two in their early 30s, and they were of varying backgrounds and occupations and we did have one legislator in attendance. And all of these people were recruited prior to the study. In Buffalo, we conducted one focus group with seven participants, four of them men, three of them and women, and this group had a really wide age range and we did have one young voter. And there was one city councilman in attendance at this focus group, and all were recruited the day of the study. In Laramie, we conducted one focus group at the University of Wyoming with students, seven of them were Six of them were female students and one was a male student. They were all under the age of 25 but were still of voting age. And they were of varying majors and years in college. And they were recruited prior to our study. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the themes that we noted throughout our community focus groups. So these comments and discussions relate to the community focus groups and not to the student focus group. Our first theme was a definition of new media our participating Wyoming residents were unable to correctly identify or give a clear definition of new media. This inconsistency in the understanding of new media influenced the responses to other questions within our discussions. For example, the focus group conducted in Buffalo noted that it was difficult to answer the question, to what extent do you use new media outlets for political information when the group did not have an identified definition of new media? Not having this definition of new media for the remainder of the focus group was a cause of anxiety to participants across focus groups, and some of them were not very happy about it, to be honest. Um, the confusion that was highlighted in the participants' responses as to what is new media, um, there were incorrect ideas noted in the focus groups, included radio talk shows, pop-up advertisements on the internet, and discussion shows with heated arguments. In addition, one group noted that any media entity of the last five to 10 years would be considered new media. Most interestingly, one group came to the agreement that person-to-person -person conversation or interpersonal communication would be characterized as new media. Um, while these Wyoming residents did have dif difficulty defining new media, participants were sometimes able to correctly identify it. 
The identified new media were relatively similar across the focus groups, and common ideas included social media, blogs, internet news sites, and YouTube. Facebook and Twitter were the most commonly reported social media. Some interesting comments that came out of this discussion were, new media is the format it is delivered in, mainly an electronic format. That new media is media that is happening right now and is an outlet where you can get information while it is happening. And then the internet seems more of a traditional media instead of new media at this stage in time. Another theme noted from the focus groups is that Wyoming residents are not using new media outlets for political news or information. If a participant was using a new media outlet, it was for entertainment. One reason why participants did not use new media for political information related to a lack of trust or the well, lack of time or that participants were too busy to use new media. Participants noted that there are quicker forms of access to new media. For example, the participants did not feel they had enough time to use new media outlets to find information online, especially when it was easier for them to turn on the TV and find the information. This was an interesting outcome of this discussion, considering that smartphone use is on the major rise and allows access to information anywhere. According to the Pew Research Center, as of September 2012, 85% of adults owned cell phones and 45% of them had smartphones. However, it is important to note that two-thirds of that percent were young people. Another reason the participants did not utilize new media for political information dealt with a lack of trust. The majority of participants were looking for accuracy, accountability, and facts from political information and did not believe new media possessed those qualities. The participants were concerned that it is unknown who is controlling social media and that internet sources are difficult to believe and to trust. The participants were also concerned with the truth behind new media and noted that most new media outlets are biased, confusing, and untrustworthy. And many noted that it is difficult to distinguish between a credible news site and one based on opinion. The participants were concerned that too many people have access to this misleading information and that too many people are putting out false or fabricated information on new media outlets. Now I'll just go over an example of when a new media outlet has lacked accuracy. So this example is from Twitter. Um, this was when Representative Gabriel Giffords was shot at a shooting in Arizona, and numerous media outlets reported over Twitter that she had died, including NPR and CNN. And while she had been shot, we all know that Giffords was, in fact, alive. So this is an example of why participants were hesitant to trust new media. In addition, since, new, since media consumers are blasted with so much information, it is difficult to remember what is true and what is false. This is a legitimate concern, as research has shown that people have difficulty remembering where they learned a piece of information, which can lead people to trust in that misleading information. From this information, it seemed that participants were closely associating new media with social media or opinion and editorial media. The interesting comments presented in this theme were, I don't understand new media or care to understand it, that the general public is unaware that things can be read by anyone online, and that the trash that flows on new media is so random and so non-certified that why pollute yourself with it? Our next theme will be feelings on the media. Um, this was an important theme of the focus group study because there was an undisputed lack of trust towards media and feelings of negativity towards the media. For example, there were little to no positive comments made about local or news outlets, traditional or new media. Participants were incredibly cynical and negative about the media, and they believed that traditional media of the past could be reported without bias, but today there is no news without certain opinion. Instead of facts, the news is more about who can possess or present the fastest opinion and participants were increasingly worried by the misleading and inaccurate information the media is producing and the fact that so many people can access this information. For example, a Gillette focus group participant related a discussion he had when he visited Oregon. The local newspaper where the Oregon resident was, where the Gillette resident was visiting was reporting incorrect information about the Gillette coal industry. However, the Oregon resident was unwilling to believe the Gillette resident when he told them that that was incorrect. Quote, the participant said, he wouldn't believe any of it because the newspaper has said it, and he was going to believe it over me. 
This conversation caused him to worry about how much of the information constituents are receiving is actually correct. Participants were also disheartened that media outlets seem to cover the same information on the same issues, which leads to a lack of richness and diversity. One participant said she felt that media try to create hype around certain stories, yet the hype doesn't come through. She compared this to a movie where the trailer has all the good scenes using the advertisement, but doesn't live up to the actual movie. In addition, the participants were not interested in listening to the arguing and confusion presented by media outlets. The discussion noted that the media will feed you the story you want to hear, regardless of if it is correct. While the participants felt negative towards the media, they still felt they have to use the media to feel engaged in politics, even if they are unsure of what to believe. Participants felt that the media makes people more cynical and turned off to politics, and that the media does not understand that people do not enjoy hearing bad things about the candidates. In addition, participants disliked when the media coverage of a campaign was more like a horse race in tracking how the swing states are voting and where the campaign money is going. Interesting comments from this, from feelings on the media were that real good reporting does not exist anymore and that no media is believable because they can report what they want from a story. A less noticeable theme presented in the focus group is how several participants felt a lack of connection and engagement with politics. Participants pointed out that the lack of give and take points on points of view in Wyoming discourages engagement since most politicians and officials are of the same political party. The participants also did not feel engaged because Wyoming is not a swing state and does not play a big part in the presidential election. On a local and state level, the participants also felt less connected because the Republican vote normally wins, making people feel as if their vote does not matter, whether they're a Republican or a Democrat. On a local level, the Buffalo Focus Group participants seem to have the most difficulty connecting politically. One participant noted it is hard for people to feel engaged on a local level when things people vote against still happen. For example, the Buffalo residents voted down a 1% optional sales tax to build a million dollar justice center, but the commissioners in the area continued with the project anyway, according to the residents from the Buffalo focus group. Other focus groups brought out similar feelings of disconnection and engagement. The majority of participants felt indifferent towards local, state, and national politics when it came to connection and engagement. Interesting comments related to political engagement and connection were, sometimes you vote in Wyoming after the election, after the election has already been decided, that even as a Democrat, you register as a Republican in Wyoming because you have no say unless you do, and that participants would like to see the electoral system changed so every voter is heard in order to increase connection and engagement. Lastly, the participants said that the lack of diversity in Wyoming in terms of politics makes residents feel incredibly disengaged. As the majority of participants in the community focus groups were over the age of 30, it was still questionable whether the younger generation of voters had similar views in regards to new media and political news. So to explore the younger generation's perspective, a focus group was conducted here at the University of Wyoming. As discussed, the majority of Wyoming residents in the study were unable to correctly identify or give a clear definition of new media. However, the student participants were more comfortable and confident in offering definitions and seemed really to have no trouble in doing so. In addition, the participants saw value in using new media outlets. For example, one participant noted how social networking can influence an election. He mentioned the Mexico elections in July when polling companies favored one candidate over another. However, the younger generation favored the other candidate and used social media to gain ground in the election. The students in the focus groups were also more comfortable utilizing new media outlets. Each participant reported at least one media, new media outlet that he or she used for news. Some of these included BBC on the internet, internet news sites, and satire TV news such as the Colbert Report. A few participants reported reading a print newspaper. However, the only print newspapers mentioned in the study as a source of news were ones that students could access for free on campus. The students' participants differed from the Wyoming resident participants in that they consistently used new media outlets for political information. And the students believed using these new media outlets for political information was an opportunity to become more connected and engaged with politics. Um, an example that they gave is that you can watch the news when you want to with new media and in the format you prefer, as with traditional media, you cannot. 
For example, one participant said, new media is more like a volley for everyone to participate, while traditional media is just there for you to sit and listen to. The participants noted that using social media for political information was helpful as it helps draws attention to the political subject itself. One participant noted that social media posts encourage people to seek political information as people often want to check if the political post is true or false. Another interesting aspect of social media use for political information was noted by the majority of the student participants. It was mentioned that some of the political information received on social media sites was received unintentionally. One participant said Facebook friends commonly share their political information that the participant does not seek out. In relation to new media, in relation to new media use other than social networking, participants also sought out political information from numerous internet sources. One important piece of information by, mentioned by participants was related to them distinguishing by the types of online media, which online types of media are reputable. For example, a, a participant who uses a specific new media outlet chooses them for their strong reputation from traditional media. The participant added that most people believe there is more, more in the reputation of the new source rather than the flashiness of the new media technology. Participants of the focus group also discussed why or why not older Wyoming residents choose to utilize new media outlets. Participants of a younger age said that they like to use it because they are more likely to know how to use the technology and more likely to want to gain information by using the technology. Whereas older Wyoming residents may be more likely to use it based on their career type. So people who have careers that already involve smartphones or computers are more likely to use new media, according to these students, whereas types of jobs that put the resident in a rural environment, such as coal mining, oil drilling, and ranching, gave the resident less opportunity for access to the technology and less access to new media outlets. The student focus group participants also felt a lack of connection and engagement with politics, similar to the participants from the previous focus groups. The participants felt that Wyoming is often overlooked because of the Electoral College, causing, politi causing politicians to not want to campaign here. Another reason participants felt disconnected was because Wyoming issues don't always consistently align with national issues, making it challenging to remain involved in politics. Now I'll talk about um, a few written comments. As I noted, our participants were asked to fill out a post-discussion survey where it's asked their thoughts on the discussion. And these were just a few of the interesting replies um, to that discussion. So the first one was, there are more varied views than I thought. And the second was, I was surprised at a perceived liberal leaning from a Wyoming focus group. I was also surprised as the moderator of the focus groups when I traveled around the state, um, the, there was a surprise Democratic leaning at most of my groups, which was kind of interesting considering how many more Republican voters we have than Democrat voters. Um, it was also noted that all, all sides find the present state of Congress despicable, and maybe everyone does and the change will occur. So this was um, a noted hope of many of the participants. It wasn't just written on one, it was written on several. And it seemed that the Wyoming residents were ready for a change that would specifically address the needs of the voter instead of a system like the Electoral College. The last one is that Wyoming is a Republican state. Guess I had no clue, I haven't been here long. Um, and just for, just for a fun reference, Wyoming has not voted Democrat in the presidential election since 1964 when the state voted for Lyndon Johnson over Barry Goldwater. So that was an interesting comment. Um, then for our results, the, Wyoming fo the focus group responses to discussion questions related to new media use, the study suggests that the Wyoming residents over the age of 30 are unlikely to utilize this new media, especially in relation to political news. While there are multiple reasons as to why Wyoming residents are not using new media, the most common was related to the inability to trust new media outlets. This lack of trust was also present in relation to traditional media. From the responses shown, it can be inferred that Wyoming residents are cynical and critical of the media. This is an is interesting result of the study as it was expected that residents would be less interested in using new media. However, it was unexpected that, Wy that Wyoming residents would be so untrusting of traditional media when traditional media was expected to be thought of as a more helpful and effective news source in a rural state. The media had varying degrees of influence on the participants. However, in general, the majority of participants felt no influence from media or a negative influence from the media. 
from this section of the study, it should be noted that Wyoming residents were unhappy with the coverage of the pres presidential election, and these led to feelings of negative influence. In addition, the media's influence has also shown to cause increasingly negative feelings among Wyoming residents. While younger Wyoming residents expressed similar feelings in relation to political connection and engagement, this was really the only similarity. The student focus groups, the student participants were highly likely to utilize new media to a full extent, and the students were also familiar and knowledgeable about different new media outlets. The student focus group participants also provided interesting insight as to why older generations of Wyoming residents would not choose to use new media. From the information presented, it can be specula speculated that the majority of older Wyoming voters do not understand or choose to utilize new media for political news or in general. However, as the younger generation of Wyoming voters grow, it appears the state will become more interested in using new media and will pro progress to a full understanding of the technology behind new media. Overall, it seemed that Wyoming residents were really not engaging in any sort of new media. While the students were most expressive of their political new media use, this was often from accidental access. So it seems that those Wyoming residents actually using new media for political information are doing so by running into it instead of actually engaging in the information. This suggests that Wyoming residents are not seekers of political information on new media and instead receive information related to politics on new media through accidental contact. That was our presentation on our focus group study. And while I'm up here, I would just like to say a quick thank you to all the people and organizations that donated to our cause um, in terms of food and refreshments for our focus groups, and also for food and refreshments at our debate, um, presidential debate studies um, earlier in the month. So we'd like to say thank you. And now I will turn it over to the presidential election group. So the second part of the research that we were doing uh, looked at the presidential debates and the effects that they had on young voters and the influence of social media. Um, so in terms of methodology and, methodology and data collection, we looked at each three of the debates. The first debate, which was about domestic issues. The second debate, which was the town hall style debate. And the third debate, which was the foreign policy. And in total, we had 340 people participate in the surveys. Um, and the data that you'll see today is an analysis of all of those participants and the survey respondents of, of them. And we had them complete three different surveys. Uh, one survey happened before the debate happened. And we saw out uh, demographic data and base political knowledge of the students that were involved with the, the participation. Uh, and then we had them watch the debate together in the classroom building. Uh, as we streamed it online from a uh, different news source, uh, from a news source. Uh, and then we, after the debate, we had them complete a post-debate survey. A lot of these included the same questions that we had in the first uh, pre-debate survey to test whether or not political knowledge had increased, as well as other uh, sorts of efficacy questions or what they were going to do with the new information from the presidential debates. And then finally, we offered a uh, follow-up survey five days later that was to be completed. Um, to test whether or not the social media effects would help to interpret the debates uh, for the respondents. Um, and we haven't yet uh, completely analyzed that data. Uh, looking at who was involved with these studies, it was here on campus and 61% of our respondents were female, while 39% were male. And the average age was 19 and a half. So a lot of these are students uh, or individuals that this is the first time that they're going to be voting, 18 to 20 years old. Um, so it, it's something new to them. Uh, and then we asked them how many were registered to actually vote. And 35% of them were registered to vote in Wyoming, which left 65% obviously to register elsewhere or not at all. Unfortunately, we didn't ask uh, whether or not they were registered elsewhere. So students who may be from out of town may be registered out. In fact, we had some, some mention that they were registered in Colorado, uh, for example. Uh, in terms of the religious background, we noticed that it often followed the demographic trends of, of Wyoming at large, uh, whereas we had the most re uh, reporting that they were of Christian affiliation and attended uh, a few times a year for services themselves. Um, we broke down 
in terms of both the party and then the ideological breakdown and ask them to respond to that question. 42% Republican, not too surprising considering the base voters here in Wyoming, and that these are students who often will be reflecting their parents' uh, beliefs uh, at, at this time. Uh, and following the ideology breakdown is similar, similar data that 36% uh, reported they were conservative or very conservative. The 27 independent uh, on the party breakdown may represent independents uh, on either side of the political spectrum where there's a significant portion of libertarian ideology that might be rep uh, represented from some of the people that were being reported on. Um, we asked them just the base political knowledge questions, things that we thought that would be uh, accessible to most people following the news. Uh, these are often students from introductory political science courses, so we thought that this would be something uh, that they would be able to get. Uh, I guess we should ask everyone our base political, political questions, uh, whether or not we can answer these questions adequately. So one of the questions that we asked, and all of these were multiple choice, uh, was who is the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives? So who is the Speaker of the House of Representatives? John Boehner, absolutely. So at least one person in the audience <laughs> got that right. Now how many of you, how many would you expect to get that correct? 50%? 15%, okay. So 15%, that's actually a little bit lower than what ended up happening. About two out of three people were able to correctly identify John Boehner as the United States House of Representatives uh, Speaker at this time. Um, that was actually a little bit lower than what I thought was going to, going to happen. Uh, do you know which party has the majority in the House and the Senate of the United States Congress? Uh, luckily, none of these have changed since the election. So, uh, so who, who do we have here? Senate, who, who's the, how, the lead of the Senate? Who controls the majority? The Democrats. And the House? The Republicans. And how many of you would expect, how many would you expect to get this correct? How much? 50%? 15% again? 18%. 18% were able to adequately identify who was in the majority of each of the branches of our Congress. We asked them uh, which of the following individuals is a justice on the U.S. Supreme Court, multiple choice again. The option was, uh, the correct answer was John Roberts, the Chief Justice, and 29% were able to correctly identify that John Roberts was in fact on the Supreme Court and the other three were not part of the United States Supreme Court. We asked them, which political party is more conservative? We thought this was the, the sort of softball give me. Uh, how many, well, what's the correct answer? The, the Republicans. Uh, and, and how many would you expect got this correct? 100%, right? 86%. 86%, so what the 14% who got this wrong were thinking, not quite sure. What this means in terms of your party affiliation, your ideological affiliation, also might be called into question. The, another, the, the last question that we asked was, uh, how much of a majority is required to override a presidential veto? Uh, the answer to this is two thirds. Uh, interestingly enough, two thirds got this, got this correct. <laughs> Uh, so the average base political knowledge was just slightly over getting two of these answers correct um, in terms of the base. So we asked them how they participated in politics most commonly over this last year. And the most frequent way in which they did it was uh, one in four people were personally trying to persuade another person to support a candidate. And this could be in a variety of different formats or forums. 24% uh, per posted a political message to social media. Here we have Facebook, Twitter, things that we were discussing a little bit before. 20% uh, contacted a media outlet or expressed a political opinion. And this actually was higher than I thought it was gonna be. These are like letters to the editor. Um, and I thought that some of the young voters may not find that these were, this was a popular outlet anymore, but one in five people suggested that they did. Uh, and finally, 17% and 15% said that they had gotten involved in activism, most likely here on campus, by either signing a written petition or attending uh, a political speech, rally, et cetera, on campus or uh, in, in the community. We asked them just 
if they were involved, just cumulatively, whether or not they were involved with this. And 33%, one out of three people said they had just done nothing to be involved with this. And then 22% said they'd done one activity, 16 done two, and then interestingly, it pops back up and we have 29% reporting that they had done three or more activities, uh, political activities. So we see a difference, either you're kind of getting involved pretty heavily or not involved at all. Um, we asked them after the debate what they had intended on doing with this information after they'd seen this, what, what they were likely to do. And this was reported on a one to seven scale of uh, not too likely or very likely to take this action. And the most uh, common thing that was reported was that they were likely to talk about the election. You'll notice that this is slightly above the midpoint um, with 4.65 saying that they are likely to talk about the election after the debates. Now, we asked them whether or not they were going to watch comedy after the election or watch news after the election. You'll notice that both are over the midpoint, but more people are likely to watch comedy than news about this. So this is like things like Saturday Night Live, The Colbert Report, Daily Show. Interestingly enough, maybe that's where we're getting most of our political, inf or more political information these days. Uh, personally trying to persuade someone, this is slightly on the underside of, of the median here, that they're less likely to use the information of the debate to persuade someone else. Uh, and to post something on political message on social media is also slightly less, maybe reflecting the sort of passive reception that we're seeing from some of the Wyoming respondents. We asked them where they've been getting their information from, uh, so different sources or formats about the news election. And I don't think it was too surprising for a lot of the young voters that about half of them were getting it from the internet these days. 29% uh, reported that they were getting it from the television. 8% uh, just aren't paying attention at all. 7% uh, from interpersonal relationships, families, uh, community groups, friends. And then interestingly enough, sort of traditional media outlets, we see a total of 11% between radios and newspapers. Uh, and this is a campus that offers free New York Times to students littered throughout our campus, branding iron. Uh, so the choice to use the internet, maybe the convenience of it, and maybe the trust of it or the familiarity of it uh, indicates that we're definitely moving away from some of the traditional sources like radio and newspapers. After we figured out that they were likely to use the internet, we asked, where do you go on the internet to get that information? Uh, and 38% reported that it was social media, Twitter, Facebook, where they were likely to get this. This was the most common area that they were likely to get it from. But one in, f uh, one in four reported that it was actually TV stations, so CNN.com, uh, places where you'd see a large uh, variety of news being covered as well. Uh, one in four also said newspaper sites, New York Times, the Denver Post, um, also getting news there. 12% said other, so aggregate websites, Yahoo, Huffington Post, anything that you might get through an RSS feed sent directly to you. And then, interesting to me, I thought that this would be a little bit higher, is only 2% said that they were going to blogs as a primary source of information. Um, perhaps this is influenced by the fact that blogs are being incorporated into newspaper sites and television news sites. Um, so, but primarily social, social media. And then we asked them um, kind of how they'd sought out some of the candidates. And one out of two people said they'd actually used a search engine, Google, uh, Bing, et cetera, to seek out the, the candidates themselves, uh, Obama or uh, Romney. Uh, one in five said that they had actually visited the website of the different candidates where they had posted their opinions. Facebook, uh, one in five, a little bit over that, said that they had actually friended one of the two candidates, as the candidates increasingly are using social media to outreach towards young voters. And one in 10 people had said that they're actually following the, the candidates themselves. Uh, we sought out through open-ended questions some of the themes or some of the responses or receptions that people had. And one of the common themes that we got through all of the debates, unfortunately, was a perception of disrespectful behavior from the candidates. Uh, we had one person say, wow, the way the moderator was treated and the questions judged, is this how the country will be managed? I felt like as though it was more like two children arguing on a playground. The presidential candidate shouldn't be arguing like a bunch of high schoolers. These sorts of 
responses were common throughout each of the debates and represented of both of the different um, candidates, both Romney and Obama received negative comments about their res respectful attitudes or lack thereof. We also saw a perception that the candidates weren't giving poignant answers. They seemed like they were avoiding the question themselves. Uh, both candidates would quote unquote beat around the bush when answering a lot of the questions, which led one person to say that they got lost according to what they were even trying to discuss. Uh, I have no idea what was going on. <laughs> may or may not be because of avoiding questions, but certainly was a common response as well. Uh, Romney should have answered the questions that would have been nice. Obama s just saying that a lot of that's not true. So again, we see that it's both candidates getting this perception that they're avoiding questions. Uh, the other thing that we noted was that a lot of candidates at, responded to what they had actually learned from the debates, which is probably a good sign. Uh, one of the most inspiring was that the, it was the first year for one individual to vote, uh, and now they know why it is important to pay attention to candidates and that the future does depend on these sorts of things. Interestingly enough, uh, someone learned that Israel is a big ally of the United States. Silly that they did not know that before. I would happen to agree. Um, <laughs> With an economy, with a, an election that was so centered around the economy or a lot of news, uh, one individual at least responded that we learned, didn't know that we had so much national debt. Uh, and then one of the other things that we noticed, and a lot of the things that students caught on to were the one-liners, the quips, the gaffes, things that were easily picked up in social media. Uh, Big Bird in the first debate when Romney suggested that he would cancel PBS. Big Bird, that's going to follow Romney forever. We had another student respond, something along the lines of, I learned that Romney wants to ch kill childhood dreams. Um, the second debate, not quite as many people picked up on the women full of binders, uh, or <laughs> binder full of women uh, line. But the third debate, a lot of people responded again with uh, the re-raise that Obama had. In terms of our military assets, we, best line, we also have less horses and bayonets. Um, so, yeah, and with that, I'll actually turn it over to the second half. Um, this next section looks at attitudes towards the candidates, and from the comments, you can see that attitudes weren't necessarily positive. Oh, yes. And um, attitudes towards the candidates weren't very positive. Uh oh. Which button do I push? found that the differences between the pre-debate and the post-debate weren't different and for either candidate. And both candidates, um, the opinions of, or the attitudes towards them were kind of on average throughout both the pre-debate and the post-debate. Um, from our questions that we asked, we found that neither candidate was thought higher of than the other and that after the post-debate for Obama, there, there was approaching significance for him for having a positive attitude, but it wasn't significant enough for, to say that we had a positive attitude towards him after the debates. Um, we also looked at voter choice and whether or not there would be changes for them, and we found that there was an increase for both candidates after the, watching the debates. And that has to do with some switching, I think, around of whether or not people had decided who they were going to vote for before. Um, we found that this is very different than the national youth. Um, our youth tend to be more in favor of Romney, um, but the national level is more in favor of Obama, but that kind of reflects the um, statewide opinion as well. Um, in general, neither candidate had a big pickup, so there wasn't a very significant change in the pre-debate and the post-debate. Um, that's kind of what this slide is about. 85% um, of voters did not change their um, choice in candidate, while well, 15 did, and some of that came from not having an opinion beforehand. So 15 people changed from no opinion to Romney and 13 from no opinion to Obama. Seven changed from Obama to none, and six changed from Romney to Obama. Five changed from Obama to Romney, and two changed from Romney to none. Um, we also looked at knowledge about the candidate, and we found that people knew less than half of the 
answers to the questions we asked. Um, um, in the pre-debate and the post-debate, they knew about half, but it's not a significant change. Um, let's see. The likelihood of voting, um, our students were more likely to vote after, the, after watching the debate than they were before, and that was on a scale of one to four. So one, not at all, and four, yes, they would. And we also asked questions about confidence in the, um, their own politics, ability to talk about it. And we found that after watching the debates, they had a greater self-efficacy about um, their own um, politics, and they had a greater external efficacy about government, elections, and politicians. And that was on a, a one to seven scale of one being not at all and seven being absolutely. After viewing the debate, um, we found that the students had a higher level of news trust. That was on a one to seven scale again. And it's interesting because the only thing that students saw between the pre-debate um, survey and the post-debate survey was the um, debate. And so it's interesting that their trust in news um, would go up after just watching the debate. Um, the most important issues before and after the debates, um, and this is for all three debates, and it was looked like things started to change around. So in the pre-debate, foreign policy was ranked fairly low, but it moved up, whereas Social Security and Medicare moved down after the debate. Um, and as someone mentioned earlier, we had Twitter going on throughout the debates on the news feeds. Um, and we, we were interested in how that was affecting the way that they were, um, the information they were gathering from the debates. And we found that um, on average, students slightly enjoyed the tweets, but it wasn't, like, it wasn't that much more over the average. And we found that the tweets were not distracting and they weren't helpful either, though. And um, for the third debate, we decided to do an experiment just to see how Twitter was impacting um, voters. And so in the third debate, we separated it out and we had part of the group watch the debate with Twitter and part of the group watched the debate without Twitter. And we found that um, Twitter negatively influenced attitudes about Romney, but it didn't influence anything else, so it had no impact on attitudes towards Obama, and the influence on candidate knowledge, voting likelihood, or on efficacy or news trust. And we were wondering if that might be because on the, in terms of the negative um, influence on the attitudes towards Romney, if that was because of the one-liners and um, the way that that kind of the Twitter kind of took off with those things. So comments about Big Bird and um, the bayonets and horses, if that kind of influenced it and so it had a more negative impact on Romney, whereas those same comments weren't, I guess, attached to um, Obama. So. Uh, one of your slides talked about a post-debate um, effects, and they, I came up with a percentage, like 20% like or something, said that they were going to, or that they did contact uh, media um, with their, some political opinion. Would, could that include, because I can't, I can't imagine that many people write letters to the other. Could that include calling into a talk show or posting a response to an online story? Yeah, we were wondering that. Sure, yeah. So um, Eric asked, he wasn't quite sure if, was I think 19% of, yeah. of students had reported contacting a media outlet for example, writing a letter to the editor, calling into a radio news show, calling into a TV show. And we were wondering that too. And I'm wondering if students understood the question. Yeah, so I think there was a problem with the instrument there because they might have been thinking, oh, I've contacted a media outlet, I've contacted Twitter. I've posted my opinions on Twitter or Facebook. And even though we didn't have any social media examples under that, question, I think maybe they elaborated a bit in their minds about what that meant. And so I think there was confusion. I mean, because when you look at national data sets and young people and that same question, it's usually not that high. <laughs> so we were surprised by that, yeah. 
It was within 12 months. Yeah, it's a good point too. So all, all the participatory questions about um, politics were in the last 12 months, how often have you blah, 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 yeah. Because so. were you more surprised at what the students didn't know about politics in terms of which House majority, which Senate majority, or you were surprised how much they did know? Or maybe you just... Yeah, um, I wasn't too surprised by it. Um, uh, unfortunately, I don't want to, you know, you, you don't want to be negative and cynical about young people, but I think that those trends that we found about the percentage who got the questions right are pretty typical, especially among young people. I mean, the average age was 19 and a half. I mean, these people, I mean, that means that that's the average. So some of them are 18, just right out of high school. They might have not have been paying attention that much. Um, so I don't think it, I was that surprised by the people who, by the percentages who got them right and wrong. Um, and hopefully, you know, with the average age being 19 and a half, and a lot of these students being currently enrolled in PALS 1000, which is the um, basic American government class, we were hoping that this would educate them a little bit more. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, in the back in red, is that your hand? Um, you after, especially for you know, the, the students who did the research and read all of the, the, had the focus groups and read the surveys and stuff, if somebody approached you and said, I want to hire you as a consultant, I'm running for governor of Wyoming, what one or two pieces of, it, of advice would you give them to really reach out to Wyoming voters? Okay, so I'll repeat the question real quick. She just asked if any of us students, um, based on the experience we've had with the debates and the focus group, if we um, were offered a job as a consultant, say, to help with the campaign of someone running for governor, what is two pieces of advice that um, we would offer Wyoming residents? Good? Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I would say I would definitely split how you would run your campaign to older generations of Wyoming voters and younger generations of Wyoming voters based on kind of what we've seen. As um, kind of the focus group showed with our older Wyoming voters, it's definitely going to be those traditional media sources that they're kind of looking to, that they think are at least more trustworthy. Maybe they still are a little negative towards the media, but they at least pay attention to those. And, um, and the one thing that people did mention that I didn't mention actually in the focus group presentation is that people were still pretty trusting of political advertisements in terms of just something that you put in the newspaper or, or a PSA you heard on the radio, something like that. So they were still pretty, pretty trusting of those things, so you could stick to that traditional line. For our younger voters, I'd definitely say that you need to pull out a major social media campaign. Um, even though a lot of them are getting it unintentionally, the, some of the students in our focus group were incredibly politically active and engaged. One of them was actually um, helping to run a campaign, as you suggest, and one of the things that she said was that in Laramie, it was very helpful for her to actually run a social media campaign on Facebook, not on Twitter, because of how many people um, use it today, and even though they might not be actively searching for it, she still got people who were more interested in the campaign and more interested in the actual candidate because of what she would post on Facebook. So, anybody else, students want to add anything? Did I understand the slides correctly that more of the participants identified themselves as Republican or conservative, yep. but less of that group was intending to vote for Romney? Uh, let me go back to the slide here. So, the breakdown, it was about 47% Republican in about 22% moderate or 27% moderate, and then followed by Democrats. Um, and so this is their, what's interesting is their, their attitudes. So I'll note that first. Um, as you can see here, we've got the attitudes toward Obama significantly increased after the debate. So we start on a scale of zero to 100. I should have noted that. Um, Zero to 100, we've got the pre-debate kind of right in the middle at 50.8 for Obama, and then after the debate, it went up by almost four points there. That was a significant change, whereas Romney um, pretty much stayed the same. You know, they, he's kind of hovered around 50 still, um, just a one-point change, and it wasn't significant. 
And we were wondering kind of why that was, you know, talking about ideas about maybe um, coming from a red state, these students are typically um, socialized politically, the chance of them being socialized politically to be more Republican or conservative. And then when they come to college, sometimes they go through a second political socialization process where they're exposed to a lot of diversity in their classes, just around campus. Their eyes might be opened more to different ideas. And um, we were wondering if maybe there was more opportunity to see change in Obama because less was perhaps known about his stances. I mean, he's been president for four years too, so, but you know, these, the, the average age again is 19 and a half. And then if you look at um, the significant difference here, there was um, no significant difference in the pre-debate attitudes. So we can't confidently say that Romney and Obama were different before the debate, but after the debate, um, it was, trending, not completely significant, but trending toward seeing more positive change for Obama. Does, does that answer your question? Does this make your students more or less cynical about politics when you have Are you asking about my, my research? Yeah. Okay. Do you want to go ahead? As the question was whether or not the students who were involved with some of the research were more or less confidence, uh, confident in uh, maybe democracy or the, the fellow voter. And I guess I came in slightly cynical, so not all the data was entirely surprising to me. But there were serious glimmers of hope in terms of people looking at the debates and saying, I will reflect critically on this. Uh, the movement from who is likely to vote after the, the debate, I thought was inspiring, that there are more people likely to get a little bit more involved. And then the other thing that I thought was, um, gave me optimism compared to where I was, was that there were still independents out there. There are people still trying to make up their minds. And there is a swath of information out there that uh, will help them to do that. And that the independents were willing to think critically about the debates and be open to, to swaying. And even though there was a lot of closed-mindedness, the independent movement that we saw, uh, I think, gives me optimism. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, but uh, I am more optimistic. Out of curiosity, when you, were do, uh, when you were watching the debate, or before the debate, or after the debate, was there, uh, in your groups, was there discussion of these issues? You know, a like general discussion among the people mm -hmm. watching? No, so before the debate, we actually had them do the survey for themselves as very much, and then we tried to minimize the amount of interaction that happened during it, so that, uh, during watching the debate, so that it was mostly their personal response as much as possible. Now that being said, when we, especially in the rooms where Twitter was being scrolled along the bottom, the outburst of laughter when Big Bird continues to come up uh, definitely puts another form of communication on there, even if, they aren't directly just talking to each other about the debates or laughter or some scoffs that may have come up. Uh, so that was the communication that was likely to occur. So did that happen when you're watching the debates if you know, the students thought something was funny did, or one side thought Obama or Romney had made a point, was it cheers? It, it was mostly the one-liners that got the big responses and it was, I think everyone loves Big Bird. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, and now that it's packaged in 140 characters or less on Twitter, I think that also makes some sense. I specifically asked them not to cheer or boo. Oh, that yeah. was specific in the instructions before okay. itself. Yeah, so that might have been why. But <laughs> looking at the, the Twitter results, we do see that they did enjoy it. Um, so, you know, on, on a scale of one to seven, or as the midpoint there, the, the tweets engage the students. So they might not have felt that they learned anything, um, or they might have not really felt distracted by them, but they did seem to get excited. They, they kind of were waiting for the next tweet to come on. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah. You know, well, what's the next comment going to be? And, you know, we also tried to minimize their own use of electronics which was 
kind of a failed effort. <laughs> I mean, so many students have smartphones. They bring their smartphones or bring their iPads, and they would be on those devices during the debate, and we would try to minimize that, but um, you can't control everything. And a lot of times they were even on Twitter or Facebook making comments about the debate, which we didn't want to stifle that, you know? So that's a challenge that I witnessed um, as a researcher of how, how to deal with that, and I'm not sure what the right answer is you know, when you're doing this kind of thing. So we spent a quite a bit of money uh, putting the New York Times and the Casper paper and mm -hmm. things around camp campus. I look at that and say, we're not spending our money wisely. Yeah, I mean, judging from the comments about, or the responses about where they received their political information from, um, it was the internet was definitely the, the top um, followed by television. Uh, so, if, you know, I'm not sure what to say to that. I mean, I like it. I like the access. A lot of the professors like it. <laughs> but if it's aimed at students, yeah, I'm not quite sure about money being spent wisely. Yeah. Conrad? Um, actually, 20 articles, you have to pay at the New York Times. I wonder uh, if any of them were actually the Pepperton. Oh, I so. But, uh, <laughs> Do you know if they're, if they're paying for access uh, to uh, online, on the internet, to uh, these? Uh... Well, I mean, the New York Times is just one outlet. Um, we didn't specifically ask them to write down all the outlets they go to for newspaper oh, online coverage. That. What's that? I said you'd probably be impressed if you asked them specifically. <laughs> But you can see here that social media is by far the biggest um, place that they get it from. And like my students were saying, a lot of it is unintentional or accidental. You know, they came across something on Facebook that their friend posted. They came across a comment on Twitter and they weren't actively seeking it out, um, which is really interesting. Uh, is that a good thing or bad thing? You know, I don't know, but at least they're getting it from somewhere is what I was thinking, because they're not going to newspapers that are printed. Uh, yes? I have a question about the political framework. Which uh, theory is being used in this study? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think that, OK, so he asked what, what theory is being used. And I think it depends on papers that come out later when we go to analyze the data more, when we go to seek publication for this research. There's so much data here that we can use that whatever theoretical approach we use is going to be dependent on how we're looking at our data. You know, um, I can see social learning theory being used, um, how people learn from the media. Um, so social learning theory, social cognitive theory could be used. Um, Uses and gratifications? Yeah, sure. We, we could do a study reporting on something like this where we've got statistics now, at least from students from Wyoming, about how they're using social media, um, where they're getting it, uh, where they're getting their political information from when they go online, what specific outlet. So I can see, yeah, that there's a lot of different theories that we could use. Got a lot of great data. It's exciting. And, and we just started analyzing it. I mean, the election just wrapped up now, and um, this is just kind of the basics that I quickly did. But we have the follow-up survey that's really interesting. So in the follow-up survey, which was about five days after the debate, we asked students many of the same questions, but we also asked them, how have you used Facebook or social media for political information since the debate? And we have some really interesting answers. Um, I was looking through some of them, and they were noting that, you know, their friends post to pay, post to Facebook, they their their friends post to Twitter, and they're paying attention to that, but they don't post. Um, and then on the other hand, some of them said that they do post, and they try to persuade their friends. So I think there's a lot of information in the follow-up survey too that we can look at. Did I see a hand over here earlier? No? Okay, well, if that's all the questions, um, thank you so much for attending. We really appreciate it. Thank you to the Wallop Fund again. I 
love this research so much, and I love that I got so many students involved. I mean, we had 340 student participants to watch the debates, and who knows how many would have watched them otherwise. So that's exciting. And just to learn more about um, the average Wyoming citizen and their use of social media for politics and new media was fascinating, and I'm hoping to get some publications out of it um, that will publicize this grant and this research. So thanks again for attending. And if you have any questions afterward, you want to come up and talk to us, we'd be more than happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much.